Having a custom Blender startup file is one of the things you can do to have things ready at your disposal and not having to set up everything from scratch in every scene that you make. So let's go over my productive Blender startup file and how you can have the same. Here we have the default Blender scene open. Let's modify it to do our evil bidding. Let's press the A key, delete everything and bring in the default Harry FBX file. Harry is biped character and he's a lot more useful than the cube. How you ask? Well firstly, Harry serves as a useful real life reference object because his height, that is the length in the Z axis is equal to the height of a human being. In 3D, we have to make everything to scale, which is a concept we talk about in my Principles of Cinematic 3D Render series. You can check it out if you like. In summary, it means that you have to maintain the real life size of objects in 3D, so that other parameters such as camera settings behave predictably as well. So with Harry as a reference, we do not have to Google the size of everything and you can make your models in relation to his size. Another advantage of having Harry as the default object is that a lot of times you need a generic biped character to model or animate or just play somewhere in the scene. So you already have him here for that purpose. I've used him a couple of times in my own projects as well and he's proven very useful. Here I hung him up for this Dementor to feed him off his soul. Good luck Harry. I'll link him in the description and you can download him for free. Alright next. Camera. So let's add in an empty object and name it cam control. Add in a new camera, move it to the side and have it face our empty object. Let's now parent this camera to the empty. Very well. And we'll add a track 2 constraint to the camera, making track object as the empty which is now called cam control. This setup does two very important things which make setting up shots a lot easier. One characteristic is that the camera always points towards the cam control object. The second is that now the camera inherits the transform parameters from the MT, which means you can rotate the MT, move it, scale it, and the camera will follow these transforms. Bear in mind that we can still independently move the camera around, so we have a second level of control with this camera rig. You're welcome. Alright, next. Let's turn on a few handy add-ons that are shipped with Blender. Go to the preferences and search for Node Wrangler. Let's turn it on. Next up, Loop Tools. Turn that on as well. Next is Import Images as Planes. Search and turn it on as well. There's also Copy Attributes menu which comes in handy in a lot of situations. So let's add it into the bucket. I would also recommend a free add-on that is not shipped with Blender but brings about a lot of quality of life enhancements and that is Machine Tools. It has curated pie menus that you can use. The one that I mostly use is Control S that goes to Incremental. It doesn't override the existing save file but creates a new file. Same functionality as the save as command but a lot faster. I personally recommend doing this incremental save after every major step. This way you have a version of every step of the way and in case you mess something up down the pipeline, which oftentimes you end up doing, you can always go back to the previous incremental save file. Another thing in this Pi menu I tend to use a lot is the OBJ FBX import and export options. These file formats of 3D models are widely used and it makes sense that only these two are available to keep things simple and fast. This menu gives them to you right at your fingertips. If you were to import the models in the usual way, you have to go through this list and carefully read the extensions till you find the FBX or OBJ. If you're importing a lot of models in your scene, you can imagine the amount of time you end up spending in the menus. This add-on comes with a lot of similar other Pi menus as well but this is what I mostly use it for. There's not an add-on review and I leave it up to you to fiddle around and discover. Alright, let's move on to render properties. We'll tweak both EV and cycles so that whenever we switch between the two engines, both are already optimized for renders. So for EV, we'll turn on the ambient occlusion, bloom, screen space reflections and motion blur. In the volumetrics dropdown, 
will switch the tile size to 2 pixels for better quality volumetrics. Under performance, turn on high quality normals. And all the way down in color management, select the look as medium high contrast. Perfect. Let's now move on to cycles. If you have a GPU, which you should if you're working in 3D, under device, select GPU compute. And if you have a GPU and you don't see the option, go to preferences, system, select optics if you have an NVIDIA GPU and then save preferences. In the viewport, dial down the max sample size to 32, which is the number of samples Cycles is going to use in the viewport render, for which 32 is enough. Under the render dropdown, the recommended thing now is to use the noise threshold value to define the amount of noise you want to go by in your render. That's a more qualitative way of defining the number of samples. However, in my experience, that generally takes a lot longer to render at 0.01 threshold. In my experience, I still prefer the more orthodox way of using samples as the main variable of quality versus render time. So let's squeeze the max sample size count to 128 as the base number and we'll increase or decrease as needed. Now caustics are complex light patterns that form after the light passes through transparent objects such as water or glass. These are notoriously hard to calculate by the render engine so we'll turn this off and frankly they don't have much effect on the final render unless you are actually going for the caustics. You can of course turn them on whenever you need them. If you want to have even faster render times, sacrificing a bit of quality, you can turn on fast global illumination approximation, but we'll keep that off for now. We'll turn the motion blur on with 0.5 shutter. Under the performance, let's turn on the persistent data, which keeps the temporary data loaded in the RAM and doesn't load it again and again for every frame. This again saves time while rendering an animation. In the color management, I prefer medium to high contrast, so we'll select that. So now our render settings are optimized for quality and speed. In the output properties, let's turn on render region to save our precious render power in the viewport. In the rendered viewport shading, this will only render what the camera sees. Next, let's focus on bringing in a generic lighting setup. I felt that whenever I bring in a model and quickly need to see the ins and outs of it in a rendered view, I listen the sound of crickets and I have to set up the lights just for that. To make the process a bit faster, let's now open the world shader and bring in an HDRI by pressing Ctrl T and selecting a neutral looking HDRI that you can download from Polyhaven. Now, whenever you shift to the rendered view, you already have a generic lighting. You can of course change it later if you wish. Let's move to compositing. We'll stick to bare essentials here and we'll denoise and add glow. Under the view layer properties, turn on the denoising data and let's have a test render of our default Harry. Let's go to the compositor and turn on use nodes. We'll add the denoise node here and connect image with image. Denoising normal with normal and denoising albedo with albedo. This will use the scene referred data, which is the uncompressed data generated by the render engine from rendering and funnel it for more effective denoising. After denoising, we'll add a glare node, change it to fog glow and quality to high. This is a fairly generic setup and you can tweak the rest of the settings according to your scene. Remember to turn off this compositing when rendering with EV because you don't need this node setup while rendering with EV. As a final thing, let's optimize our interface a bit. In the viewport shading dropdown, let's change the lighting to matte cap and turn on cavity. This will make identifying any shading errors during the modeling process and highlights the hard edges a bit to make out the geometry at a glance. At the right side, let's split the window and change the editor type to 3D viewport. Let's press 0 on the numpad to switch it to camera view. Disable overlays, disable gizmo. Press home key to frame the camera to bounce. Now you have a constant camera view setup here all the time so you know what your camera sees at all times. One thing however is that the default blender does not have a camera rotation lock as far as I know. So if you impulsively rotate this camera view, it will go off camera. This personally puts me off sometimes. So if you go to the view tab here, you'll see that blender doesn't ship with lock view rotation option. To mitigate this, 
There's a small Blender add-on with few lines of code on Blender Stack Exchange that adds the functionality to lock the view rotation. I'll link the code down below. Just copy this in the notepad with the extension .py and save it. Install it in Blender like you would any other add-on. Now you see that this functionality has been added. When you check this now, the camera rotation is locked and set in place. Now when you try and rotate the view, the view is essentially locked. You can still zoom in and out if you want. In the end, go to File, Defaults, Save Startup File. Close Blender. And now when you reopen it, the things you set will all be there ready at your service. So there you have it, a customized Blender startup file that will serve you well. If you struggle with lighting, I've devised a lighting process that will give you a sound method to set up your lighting. You can check that if that's something you struggle with. Let me know your thoughts and if you'd like to add on anything, like if this was helpful and subscribe if you want. I will see you soon. Farewell.